So first, I'm going to welcome to the screen here with me is Suzette. Suzette, go ahead and turn on your volume and turn on your video. Hey, how Hi, are everybody. you? Great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me today. Dana. Absolutely. So Suzette is here with us after receiving a diagnosis in January of this year. Um, after her request for a screening showed a tumor in her right breast, she was diagnosed with stage two invasive ductal carcinoma and underwent a bilateral mastectomy in June. She's currently undergoing her chemotherapy treatments and still has in her expanders in preparation of radiation therapy coming soon. Suzette is a comedy producer and has also created hashtag strong black boobs, an effort to inspire others and heighten self-esteem among all patients, but especially patients of color. Suzette, I know you bring a smile to my face and I appreciate mm -hmm. you being here with me today. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to join you. So we know that you have a long story and I, I want to just touch on it briefly. Um, you also had a mother that was diagnosed with breast cancer. So tell me a little bit about um, your finding your lump and, and a little piece of your breast cancer diagnoses. Oh yeah, I was, well, because my mom died of breast cancer, I was very diligent with getting mammograms every year. And so uh, for my last mammogram, well, usually for my mammograms, they always have me come back because I have dense breasts, but for my last mammogram, they, um, you know, asked me for another to come back again. And then that's when they told me in January that they had found um, a, a nine millimeter lump and they did a biopsy. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was cancerous and they also did a lymph node biopsy, but that wasn't cancerous. So they had very good odds for me. So, um, so yeah, so I was diagnosed in January and then um, I had an operation in June because of COVID. It was uh, put on hold. But in the meantime, they put me on an astrozole to um, help in to lessen the, the growth of the tumor. But so, one funny thing they did tell me was that when I was diagnosed, one of my doctors told me that um, I had something called um, an old white lady's cancer, which meant to me that it was a curable, um, non-aggressive, and I'll look great in turquoise. <laughs> I, I already knew this was gonna happen. You know, I was gonna like, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna keep a straight face. This <laughs> is that, knew you were gonna make me laugh eventually. But you're, you're right. And I think that a lot of this conversation here today is that breast cancer, as we know, does not discriminate. Mm -hmm. And it affects no matter how young or how old or what size, color, or shape you come in. Um, breast cancer knows no bounds. And I think that this is such an important story of, of who you are and what you've been through and, and seeing your mother battle breast cancer, right, in, in such a way and, and metastasis, you know, after her surgeries, I think she got a unilateral mastectomy, you told me, and then, you know, battling through stage four progression as well. So I would think that when you got your unfortunate diagnosis, you, you were kind of thrust into a world that you knew a little bit about. Um, you had experienced it on the side of your mom. So when it came to you making choices that were best for your body, uh, who did you mostly talk to about your surgery options? Um, uh, I started with my breast surgeon and, um, uh, and I made sure that I taped the conversation cause I didn't want to miss in case I missed anything. You know, I was only, I only take about 25% of anything and take it normally. So I'm sure in a doctor's office is about 10, but I made sure I had my girl squad with me. My girl squad had their phones going. I had my phone going, but, um, but the, it was, um, I started with one breast surgeon and then after that, and I also made, I started off with a list of questions as well that I pull from the internet. Mm -hmm. And then I also started to just, you know, one in eight women have been diagnosed with cancer. So more than likely, you know, somebody, you know, you know, I tell everyone on my floor in my building that, I, that, that they're welcome because, you know, if it's one in eight women that have breast cancer, seven of them on my, on my floor, like are very lucky. So I try to find that one other person that, you know, there are so many women out there. So I started talking to them. So I compiled the list of questions and I just marched into the breast surgeon's office and I just sort of went through them and, um, and you know, and I just listened for little things. I wanted to make sure that I had a breast surgeon that not, not only was experienced, but was also like doing teaching, maybe involved in clinical trials, like, um, you know, that was um, doing outreach, maybe, you know, someone that was also active and seeing what else was happening in the, in the breast community, that they weren't just so focused on, you know, breast surgery, but like, you know, you know, what else is coming on scientifically? And, and also what, what was important to me was that they dealt with women of color. So I, I think that this is such an important piece. So you chose, um, and, you, and you met with multiple surgeons. So tell me about I, your discussions with plastic surgeons, because you did not just go and meet one, one and done. You, you went in. Okay. It was five breast surgeons, five hospitals, six plastic surgeons, two oncologists. 
So, um, and right now I'm on like my second radiologist, but um, yeah, it was, uh, what was really important to me with breast surgery was that, um, that, it, that it was, they understood a black woman's skin and body. I mean, black women, keloid, um, you know, I didn't want to see, the thing is about my, because my mom had a unilateral mastectomy and the thing is, and so she went around and I, 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 you know, she was a woman who didn't have insurance. So, and I have no idea what her options were, but she basically was disfigured. I mean, to me, I mean, I don't know if she was happy with that, but uh, she never expressed it, but she had a unilateral and then this huge, like, you know, my mom was like double, tripled. I have no idea, but it just hit her a boob always hit her knees. The second, the other one just like, just kind of was just, I don't, I don't know how she was able to balance, but, um, but it was really important to me that, um, that I saw photos from, um, of the work that the plastic surgeons were doing. And, and I went into one major hospital and I couldn't believe like the photos that they showed me. It was like, it looked like a, it looked like a Tuskegee Institute experiment. Like I, you know, I, I, I and, and when I asked them to show me another doctor who, um, who also was at that hospital too, it was the same thing. I was like, I, I was like, I can't believe that you show these photos to people. So, so it was really important that, you know, I had my, um, I had my, I saw, like the work that um, that the plastic surgeons were doing, and I also had testimony too from the women, some women of color that had gone to the plastic surgeons. I think that that's really uh, so much to handle when you just got newly diagnosed. How did you find yourself balancing uh, both navigating your cancer treatments, but also navigating your reconstruction or reconstructive choices? Um, well, I think it was because, I mean, I was motivated by what happened to my mom. I mean, my mom lay dying on a gurney in a public hospital, you know, um, because, uh, you know, she was poor, didn't have insurance, um, you know, and so because of that, I mean, like, you know, you know, that experience, like, just stuck in my, I mean, like, it, it just stuck in my head, like, I had, and so from that point on, I was, I wasn't crying anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, when, when I turned away for a moment from my mom in that gurney, like somebody had stolen her wig. And I was like, who in this hospital has my mom's wig? I mean, like, are people that desperate for weaves in this house? Like who in Brooklyn, like give her back her, wig? I couldn't believe it. It's just like, it was just so insane. So because of that, I was just, just motivated to be this warrior. It's like, I, you know, to use everything in my power to make sure that I was educated. And I was also trying to educate people and I'm still educating myself. Like I'm still learning stuff. It's like, it's not stopping that you know along the surgery like I, like I'm still wondering like maybe I should have done something different but as long as I know that I'm learning and I keep it and that's why I'm, I'm happy that you guys have joined this and I'm happy that I'm still you know it's about it's a learning process you know but you you know you just have to just keep you know it's just a matter of um of um your friends are great make sure that you have somebody like people that are motivating you you know to to just you know like they care about you to make sure and that they're trying to get information too so it's about information you know, that's what it is. It's about like making sure that you get the information, you know, that you have to fight for yourselves. This is, um, your your energy is contagious. I, I know you're in chemo. I have no idea where it's coming from, <laughs> but I'd love you for it. That being said, let's talk about, you're in your expanders right now. Tell me how does being in your expanders feel? They feel awesome. I mean, if I ever trip and, and fall in the shower, I'm gonna float. It's amazing. I mean, amazing. I mean, the thing is like when I was first diagnosed, I thought I was stage like early stage. So I didn't think I would have chemo or radiation. So I was like, give me the free boobs. It's better than free cheese. It's great. Awesome. I love it. So the expanders feel great. They actually feel like something a little bit robotic. Like you've got stuff like kind of just kind of attached and screwed onto your body. But, um, but I think self-esteem wise, I feel great. I feel a complete, I mean, like, I can't imagine like what my, you know, what was going through my mom's head? Like I, you know, um, it's it's a, uh, and I feel like I'm I'm happy to have choices. You know, I'm happy to have choices between a unilateral, between going flat, between having the expanders. But you know, I think that this is what works for me. I'm I mean I'm comfortable with them. So to wrap this up, because you're so well informed, you've really set out to educate yourself and to educate others, and you're really quite honestly in the thick of it, right? What's your advice to somebody um, that's get you know getting a diagnosis or up against reconstructive options? Um, what what's kind of your little tidbit of advice or experience you would like to share with them? I think more than anything is just making sure that you have other people around you that can be your support system. That can if they can't go to the the doctor's appointments with you, I had people on phones. I had you know 
two phones with speaker phones and recording left and right? Or, or you also make sure that you record stuff and your doctor should make sure that they're happy with recording stuff and, and go with, and also, um, you know, just go with a list of questions more than anything. And, and um, don't look at the photos of reconstruction on the web. I found that the ones that were on the web, they made me cry. I was like, I can't, these are so, these are so awful. <laughs> don't look at any, fo any photos that are on the web or not. I don't know how they got there, but yeah, but, um, but, um, but yeah, I would just make sure that you just have, you, you go with a list of questions and, and just go from start from there and just in your recorders and your girl group, your girl squad. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Um, if again, as a reminder, if anybody has any questions for expanders or implant reconstruction that Suzette can answer at the end, please be sure to put them in the Q and A. Suzette, please let everybody know in the chat how to find you, follow you and, and help support you along this journey. Thank you so much and we'll be back soon here. Thank you. All right, so next is Maha. She was diagnosed when she was 39 years old and she received a triple negative breast cancer diagnosis two years ago with a BRCA um, BRCA2 genetic mutation. She underwent a single mastectomy at diagnoses and followed up with the mastectomy on her other breast in 2019. She chose to proceed with a deep flap reconstruction. Maha is also a dance hall dancer from Canada and also knows that she's a crazy cat lady. So Maha, please join me. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your story. Thank you for having me. I, I want to kick off with, with you um, giving us a little bit of background um, about your unique diagnoses and how this kind of happened in two phases for you. Sure. So it was literally I was getting ready for work one day and I found that lump went to the doctors and that's when it all started, got my pathology report. And unfortunately it was stage three C, triple negative metaplastic breast cancer. And that's when the journey started. So you started first with the choice of removing the- um, The right the side. With the, with the tumor in it. And at that point you did not reconstruct, is that correct? Yes, because they said you need to do chemotherapy right away, just in case because I'd already started traveling into my lymph nodes. So when I got my right breast removed, they also removed all of my lymph nodes. And unfortunately, there was a lot of positive lymph nodes. So, so you had your mastectomy surgery, no expander was put in at, at time of surgery. You went through your chemotherapy and also radiation? Yes. And, and when you uh, went back under the knife for the other breast, um, is that when you're, tell us when your reconstruction started. Sure. So during my chemotherapy, my genetics came back and I found out that I had the BRCA2 gene mutation. Mm -hmm. So that's when I decided to do two preventative surgeries and one of them being removing my left breast. And for a while, I did have to li li live with like two breasts that were gone. So I think it really affected my mental health. And so that's when I decided to attend Broad A, it's Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day in Toronto. And I was able to meet my surgeon there and just learn about reconstruction. And I knew right away that I wanted to use my own tissue. So I decided to have a deep flap surgery. This is, this is one of those experiences, right? Where there's so much programming that's put into place to help patients understand what their reconstruction options are. And the, yes. and the fact that you met your surgeon and learned about reconstruction at Bra Day, which is uh, for everybody that uh, isn't quite aware of this, this is Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. It happens on, I believe, the third Wednesday of every October, but most hospital systems and organizations get behind to talk about advancements, new opportunities, and, and your choices uh, to reconstruct or not to reconstruct. So. Maha, since you went out and sought out your information, tell me what, what other things did you use to like weigh into your decision-making process? I just knew that I really wanted to use my own tissue. I mean, I had a lot of it anyway, so might as well use it. <laughs> um, the only thing that kind of really scared me was, I'm gonna be honest, it is a long surgery. I was under the knife for 11 hours and you have to go into ICU after that just in case it does die and it doesn't work with you. And the recovery is long. I was sleeping on a reclining chair for a whole month. I couldn't move, I needed help. So I wouldn't advise it for people that have little children unless they do have help. But honestly, Awareness Day, the Breast Awareness Day event has helped me so much. Just learning about reconstruction and what they can do for you, there's always hope. 
did you, you know, let's talk about the recovery process a little bit, because I do think that this is important um, for, for flap shirt surgery specifically. Uh, tell us a little bit, did you, did you walk away with any tips or tricks for others that are preparing for their flap surgery or, or maybe are still in the midst of re recovering from one? I would say get your husband or your partner, your mom or anybody to buy you the reclining chair because it's, it's basically two surgeries. You're getting your stomach cut and you're also getting new boobs. So it's, you can't move everything that you're doing, whether you're lying down and you're getting up, you're using your muscles from your stomach. So you definitely need help. And I know sometimes it's so hard to ask for help, but help is what's going to help you recover and have a lot of Netflix ready for you. <laughs> Just go ahead and start saving the queue now, yes. like, right? <laughs> What, um, what, if anything, did you, did you do any external research? Did you meet with other patients or um, other people that had undergone the surgery to get informed outside of the doctor's office? I did. So I'm a part of uh, Rethink Breast Cancer and I do a lot of volunteer work for them in Canada. And I did ask about like their surgeon, the reviews. I even Googled, like I'm a Googler. So I Googled just like ratings on doctors. And I knew that's when I knew that the surgeon that I wanted was speaking. It so happened that she was speaking on Broadway. So I went and spoke to her right at the event and she got me in really quick. You just have to advocate for yourself. I think it's very important. I think that that's such a beautiful way to round that all out is, is that you, it's that since you, your story kind of took you through two years, right? The mastectomy, the removal of the healthy breast, mm -hmm. Um, I believe you also, did you also have a hysterectomy due to your BRCA2 gene? Uh, oophorectomy. Oophorectomy, yeah. You know, so you had all of these decisions ahead of you. And, and as you prepared for your reconstruction, um, how, how did you know, since you, since you were living flat for a little while, you know, like, when did you kind of know that reconstruction was right for you? When I lost my second breast. It didn't hit me until I lost both. And I was like, I couldn't forget about it when I, I'm starting to like get teary eyed here. But like when I shower, I can't forget that I, I had cancer. You see scars, you see nothing. And it's like, you know, you're a woman, you want breast. And I, I honestly give kudos to people that stay flat because it's just, I couldn't do it. It really affected my mental health. And I became depressed because I lost both from cancer. So I and knew I, I wanted to just, you know what, let's just go down that road use my own tissue and just do it. But I think this is, this is the, the segue to, to say you really have to make decisions that are best for yourself. Um, the, the likelihood of um, having a, a breast reconstruction option that's right for you is, is fairly likely today more than they were before. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have it. And you're right, Maha, you, you did what was right for you and your mental health. And and it's, it's been a, a long uh, story for you, but you know, we're so thankful that you're here and thank you for sharing openly. Again, Maha is our flap ex patient expert here on this panel. So if you have any questions about flap surgery, please be sure to put them in the Q&A. And obviously Maha as well, share your information in the chat so anybody can reach out to you following the panel. Thank you. Okay, so next is Sarah. She received her triple negative breast cancer diagnosis with a BRCA1 mutation in just February of this year. She's 34 years old. Sarah opted for flat closure following her bilateral mastectomy, has finished her chemo treatments, and will wrap up radiation on Tuesday. She fancies herself the biggest Chicago Bears fan ever, and you won't catch her on a Sunday without her Walter Payton jersey, but I did ask her if I was going to see one on her today, but of course, um, you know, she's a panelist for the LBBC annual conference, so she's going to have to sport it later. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I didn't want to stray the conversation in, in another direction. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've got people from all over, but uh, LBBC is Philly Nation here, so um, I think you made good choices. <laughs> Eagles Nation over here. Um, all right, so let's dive in because you're really, like, you are all in the thick of it. It was really, you know, the conversations I wanted to have was just here, the here and the now. Um, like I mentioned, you finish up radiation on Tuesday, but let's back up a little bit and just tell me a little bit from your story, how you found your diagnoses, how you found your cancer. Of course, I was actually at my annual exam uh, with my OBGYN 
And I've been very religious since I was younger, you know, when, when I started to go every single year, making sure. So I'm very proactive about my health. And this year uh, she found a lump, which interestingly, about a year prior, I, uh, she found a, a different lump, diff same breast, different place, did a biopsy, totally benign. Year later, found another one, went through the process of a mammogram as well as ultrasound. And uh, it was positive for cancer in, in multiple places in my right breast and my lymph nodes. So it was, it was that moment of that confidence factor of, oh, it's nothing. I've had something like this before. And then that overwhelming emotion, as well as just almost going blank <laughs> in your head of this can't be real. There's, there's no possible way. So there's this odd denial uh, that, that you tend to have as well with that diagnosis. And that started the journey that I'm currently on. So in, in going through all of that and with uh, the BRCA1 mutation, uh, how did you come to the decision of having a bilateral mastectomy? I, I think you said it best. You know, when, when you have this particular mutation and you find out that, you know, this is something that has not only started or spurred your cancer, but has the potential, you know, of coming back as a new cancer in a different breast. Um, obviously ovarian is also something to consider. You, you really start to make informed decisions for yourself and for your health. You know, we all have a will to live, every single one of us, and you, no matter what, are going to do everything in your power to make sure that happens for the long term. So that right there alone, that will to live, and you know that overwhelming i think emotion that comes with wanting to cure your body of cancer was extremely important uh, when it came to the decision that i made to get a bilateral mastectomy so you opted for flat closure after your or while during and in the midst of your treatment uh, do you feel like you were open to having conversations about reconstructing or not reconstructing and, and were your doctors supportive of this decision? I never, ever wanted reconstruction. Uh, I knew immediately. And interestingly, it was, it was twofold. One was I actually have a history of blood clots. So a lot of women, you know, who are diagnosed with cancer, you know, they have comorbidities, they have other issues that need to be taken into consideration thoroughly when, when making this decision with, with your physician and, and in some cases, friends or family, you know, who really help provide that influence and support. So that was one of the biggest concerns I had was I do not want to potentially put myself at risk during a very long surgery for another blood clot. I already have enough going on, right? We don't wanna add one more thing to the plate that, that could potentially lead to you know, other issues. So that was one of my biggest decisions, but also at the same time, it is a longer, I know, journey, if you will, when it comes to reconstruction, there's, a, there's multiple surgeries that come into play. And I couldn't emotionally, um, handle that. I, I couldn't. I, I wanted to have this one and done uh, type of, of surgery that would just get me to the other side and then start my next treatment and keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. So I didn't want there to be, you know, a, a time and time again, having to go back to the hospital. And that was a personal decision. You know, it was, it was something where I, I knew immediately my physician, my surgeon, uh, I don't want to say tried to convince me by any means, but definitely challenged, you know, my decision making saying, are you sure this is, this is a very big decision, you know, females really, you know, have uh, just as strong as an emotional as physical journey when it comes to not having your breasts. And historically, it can hit a little harder when you are looking in the mirror and Maha said it best and, and you see that cancer took something from you that's personal, that makes you very feminine and female. And it, it was something where no matter what, no matter what people said to me, I knew that this was the decision I was gonna make and there was no straying from that. 
I think that that's such a, and I'm so happy that you shared that very personal space um, as far as making your decisions, because there, there really is no wrong decision here. The decision is only up to you and you yourself. And I think that's a very important thing that we all embrace that uh, you might feel pressure to undergo reconstruction, either through the medical office or even through your friends and family. Um, but if it's not right for you, you don't have to do it um, and, and vice versa, right? Really. So Sarah, this is just so incredibly inspiring that I would love for you to finish up on, on what would your advice be for, for that patient that's just teetering and isn't really sure if they do or if they don't, how did you find your path to making the best decision for you? You know, I think, I think there's a very important part of coming to a consensus that you know is permanent, right? That's, that's tough. And, and when I say permanent, you know, of course, to back up a little bit, I know you can get reconstruction at a later time, but a lot of times I think women who go flat, you know, stay that way. Uh, I will say emotionally, and I think this is a very important part of it, when I looked in the mirror for the very first time, I actually got sick to my stomach. I, I couldn't handle it. I was like, this is, this is not what I'm used to. This is not what I'm used to seeing every single day. Uh, so there is this, I think, phenomenon that we have of uh, a lack of recognition as to what your life is and what it will be moving forward. For you to feel every emotion, ground yourself in every decision, think to yourself, what is going to be the best for me? not what's going to be the best for everyone around me. That's what's going to help you come to a comfortable place in your mind and in your heart and in your body to know that this is what is going to get me to the other side physically uh, as I look at myself and, and from a vanity standpoint. Um, I will also say, and this is silly, but it's, it's something that I even take a little bit of comfort in. When I put on a shirt over my head for the first time, I'm like, well, that lays nice. I've never seen something lay so comfortably before, you know, and, and there's just little wins along the way that I think you need to allow yourself. And, and that's what's going to, I think, help a lot of people is, is ensuring that you feel and think and decide every step of the way and ensure you are doing it for you and only you, because you know you best. Beautiful, Sarah. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to welcome back Maha and Suzette so we can dive into some of these questions. You guys are all such beautiful people with such inspiring stories. And, and thank you for your openness and your transparency and, and sharing your stories with us. Um, I'm also going to welcome back Dr. C because I do have a few medical questions for our um, expert. And, uh, and, and Dr. C, you are uh, an incredible, incredible plastic surgeon at PRMA in San Antonio, Texas. And um, for anybody tuning in from Texas, they must, must, must go to, to visit and consult with you guys. But um, do you wanna just take a, a brief second to introduce yourself here as I, as I compile the questions for you? Yeah, thanks Dana. We don't have too long, so I'll keep it quick. Uh, yeah, PRMA plastic surgery, that's my practice. San Antonio, Texas. We uh, actually see people from all over, not just from Texas. We specialize in breast reconstruction, pretty much all we do. Um, and really, after doing it for so long, um, you know, I realized that, you know, what we're hearing today is what everyone goes through. These are, this is like Groundhog Day. And it's part of it is it's a little bit upsetting, I think, because every, every, these conferences and webinars and stuff I do year in year out it's the same themes over and over and you know thank god for uh, advocacy groups like living beyond breast cancer um, for addressing this um, uh, you know as a community we need to do better you know so uh, I will plug the breast advocate app because a lot of what's coming up in these questions that I'm seeing um, you know questions about aesthetic flat closure, uh, tattoos, uh, breast cancer recurrence, recovery, uh, ARAS protocols, all these things that they're, they're in there. So please check out the Breast Advocate app as well. It's a free app for download. 
Yeah, and just just to piggyback on that plug, um, I've I've been gracious or I've been honored enough to to pro provide some patient feedback over the years, and just it's such a great way for um, you to lean into shared decision making for yourself and for your medical professionals. So, check it out for sure. I want to just quickly, Dr. C, jump to you for um, any of those patients that have been canceled. Uh, their reconstructive surgeries have been canceled due to COVID. Um, any tips or tricks you can give them to uh, get back in their surgeon's books, uh, get back on schedule, things like that? Yeah, so a lot of it's going to be very geographic. Uh, we all have different um, issues that we're dealing with geographically. Though it's, 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 it's more about timing. You know, I think it's going to impact everyone everywhere. It's just when it's your turn, unfortunately. So ask about the protocols in your respective hospital. Um, we are seeing now that in some places it is business as usual in terms of the procedure that patients can get. It's not business as usual in terms of the protocols, the safety protocols, because there are a ton more hoops to jump through to keep everything safe, uh, like preoperative testing and distancing and visitors in the hospital and all that kind of stuff. So please just take all those protocols very seriously. Um, but in most parts of the country, breast reconstruction is back on. Thank you. Uh, Maha, I'm going to jump in for a quick one. What's your favorite recliner for flap surgeries? You know what my husband bought for me? I don't even know the brand. <laughs> Any, <laughs> recliner. Any recliner will do. That's what you're saying. Yes, that's what yes. I'm, a cup holder. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But the best <laughs> is on each side if your husband bought there you it. Go. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, um, Okay, uh, Dr. C, this is a great question for you because I happen to know the FDA has just updated their requirements for breast implants. If you do decide to go uh, with breast implants, how long uh, can you have the implant in until it needs to be replaced? Well, the FDA, you know, is still saying 10 years. Uh, so really, um, the, the latest uh, meetings and, 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 and guidance revolves around you know, ALCL and texturing. So really it's the recommendations haven't changed much in terms of how long you should keep them in. The FDA was saying 10 years and the manufacturers are still saying 10 years. Having said that, if everything is fine at 10 years, you know, I myself in our practice, we don't automatically book people for surgery just because they've had implants in for 10 years. If everything looks fine, feels fine, and there are no issues, then personally, I'm not going to rush someone back for surgery because all surgery has risks. Uh, and if everything is fine, why expose people to risks? That, that's my personal philosophy. I do think it's very important that women understand it's not put them in, forget about them. There's maintenance. You've got to monitor yourself. Um, ongoing uh, ultrasounds, um, starting a few years after you put them in, every other year, maybe timed with your well woman check. Uh, I think it's a good idea to ch make sure that your silicone implants uh, are still intact because you can have a silent silicone implant rupture and not know about it. If you have saline implants and you have a rupture, then things just deflate. And they're uh, saying now f five years for an MRI and two years following up, is that is that the new uh, well, it's not, there's no general consensus for the monitoring. So it used to be, the, the, the FDA used to say, you know, MRIs every two years. Okay. I think that's excessive. I don't think you need that. It's also expensive. Uh, women get claustrophobic in MRIs as well. Um, it's not a walk in the park. What we do, what I do in my practice is starting at three years after surgery. Um, that's when you get your first ultrasound. And then um, if, you want to, if you want to extend it to five years, I'm fine with that. And then every other year. Great, thank you. Um, so, so this is a question from Anne. Um, Maha and Suzette, maybe just a real quick answer here. Uh, did, how did you decide on implant versus flap? I know Maha, you talked a lot about using your own tissue and, and Suzette, maybe we'll start with you because we didn't touch on that in your chat, but um, how did you choose implant over flap surgery? Uh, my plastic surgeon said that I wasn't eligible for flap because I didn't have the um, the tissue in my stomach for it. So that's why I went for implants over flap. Plus also I was doing some reading and maybe the doctor can address this, but um, you know, I've heard that sometimes when you use your own tissue that it can also um, at some point like be absorbed. 
by your body and then you end up having to do surgery again. So that was sort of a, a consideration as well. Uh, Dr. C, do you want to just touch on that really quick? I, there's also a question here in here about maintenance following a flap surgery. We talked about surveillance for implant, but um, yeah. is that maybe part of that that maintenance for flap so, surgeries? Yeah. So um, you know, not everyone's a candidate for everything. Implants don't do well, generally speaking. Um, most of us, most of us plastic surgeons feel that implants aren't the first choice option when radiation is on the cards because there's an increased risk of problems, especially long-term with implants in someone who's had radiation. Increasing hardness, things can get tight and they can even get painful. So the gold standard is tissue, using the patient's own tissue. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have an implant if you've had radiation, I'm just saying your chances of problems with the implant are higher. They're significantly higher, in fact, if you have had radiation or will be having radiation. Some women, that's the only option. And some women, they just quite frankly can't stand the idea of a scar on another part of their body, which is part of tissue flap surgery. The tissue has to come from somewhere. A tissue flap is a piece of tissue that's taken from another part of your body and transplant it to your chest to create a new breast. That in and of itself doesn't get reabsorbed. The type of tissue reconstruction that does is, uh, that is associated with, with reabsorption is fat injections, fat grafting. So you can reconstruct the breast with fat injections. That's the technique that's associated with reabsorption, partial reabsorption. So for, so and one more point, and one more point it, you know, not everyone offers all flap options. So unfortunately, and we see this a lot at PRMA, we see a ton of women who have been told they weren't a flap candidate for a variety of reasons. Most of the time, the surgeon thinks the lady is too thin. That's not necessarily the case. So if you really want to look into flap reconstruction, please, please, please make sure you talk to someone who does a lot of them. Perfect, yes, 100%. Um, just to piggyback on that, if uh, with the screening after flap, um, even actually screening after front closure and potentially implant, I mean, implants get chest MRIs, but uh, how will they know, one of, uh, one of the women asked, how do they know if the cancer returns in the chest wall? Like, do you know from touching it, from an exam, or does it have to come through some sort of screening? Yeah, that's a great question. There's, so we do know from studies that, that uh, reconstruction doesn't increase your chance of recurrence. So that's very important for women to know whether you have, whether you have an aesthetic flat closure or have reconstruction, whether you have implants or a flap, it makes no difference to your, your risk of recurrence. That's number one important thing to know. Number two, there isn't a consensus on screening after you have mastectomies and reconstruction. Many women choose mastectomies because they don't want to bother with screening anymore. And then they, they, find, they find out later that their surgeons still want them to do the screening. Um, it's more common with a tissue reconstruction because with tissue, you can get areas of hardness called fat necrosis. And also, if you have a nipple sparing mastectomy, sometimes a little bit more tissue is, is left behind that will benefit from screening. So basically, it's the same screening, whether it's mammograms or MRI, self-exam, whichever way you go is crucial. So women have to do that. No one is going to know your breasts or your new chest because you can get a recurrence underneath. The, when you go flat, you can get a chest wall recurrence. So you've got to examine yourself. Uh, reconstruction as well examine yourself month, uh, monthly. Great, so um, I, I know that uh, Lillian was asking about mastectomy tattoos. Uh, Maha, thank you so much for answering that in the chat. I too have mastectomy tattoos. Uh, we, will not, we will not offer our, our opinions from Dr. C <laughs> on our mastectomy tattoos. No, just kidding. Um, just make sure that you are seeking out incredibly safe, well-respected, uh, well-noted, tattoo artist, just like any other art, like your plastic surgeon, and absolutely consult your doctor just to be safe and make sure that you are making the right decisions for your body. Um, all right, so uh, we only have just one minute left. There are such great questions here in the chat. 
Um, I know that uh, there's been questions about support groups and further information. Living Beyond Breast Cancer at lbbc.org has so much uh, trusted and vetted information out there for your surgery decisions. Dr. C mentioned breast advocate. Um, go on there as well for shared decision making and understanding of all of your reconstruction options. Um, I know we've got some questions here about revisions and uh, changes from side to side. So I know these are all super important questions. I wish we had more time to answer them. Um, but that being said, thank you so, so much for you all being here. Uh, thank you, Maha, Sarah, Suzette, Dr. C. We really couldn't have um, had such an incredible informed conversation this afternoon. Um, again, I can't finish anything more than saying no decision is a wrong decision. It's 100% what is best for you, your body, and your treatment. So please do not forget about that. Um, please feel free to reach out to any of the panelists uh, with questions, uh, myself included. And thank you all so much, and we'll see you soon.